And I do want to acknowledge the presence with us of the Add the Tenth campaign, which uh, we're again glad to support, and members of the INOU as well, and others. And indeed, there's been a very strong civil society campaign around the need to add a tenth ground of discrimination into our equality legislation, uh, to, to join the nine grounds already there in, in, those, in those acts. And I'll speak in a moment more about the equality legislation. But just to say that uh, I think, you know, again, just acknowledging Minister O'Brien's words, that uh, there is an equality review underway, a review of the equality legislation. I think we're all very conscious of that uh, in accordance with the commitment in the programme for government. And I'm glad to hear confirmation, Minister, that there, there's a report to be published shortly arising out of that review and indeed that Minister O'Gorman intends to bring forward legislative proposals. So I think that's, it's good to hear about that progress. But I do think it's disappointing that government have put down an amendment to this bill to require that the reading of, se of at second stage is to be delayed, I think, for 18 months. That just strikes me as being uh, far too long uh, a time, given that that review is underway, given, Minister, that you've said a report is imminently to be published, or to be published shortly, certainly, this year, and, uh, and that there are legislative proposals under consideration. So I think it would be it would, it would seem just too long a period to delay or defer reading of this bill at second stage, a uh, full 18 months. I think uh, other government amendments that are sim you know, in private members' legislation in this term have, relate, have referred to shorter deferral periods. And I think it's a somewhat unreasonably long period, given how much work is underway, given that there have been private members' bills on this issue before, and given that there is a strong civil society campaign too. Um, Obviously, it's up to the proposed to Deputy Wynne to decide whether to accept, it, I think, whether to oppose the government amendment. But, uh, but I would say this, that we do have instances of other private members' equality bills that have passed more speedily through the Houses uh, with cross-party support. And in 2015, I was glad that as a senator, my Equality Miscellaneous Provisions Act to prevent discrimination against LGBT um, um, individuals by religious-run institutions, schools and hospitals, that that bill uh, was, was brought into law. And I share that experience to remind the sponsors of the bill and the government ministers that through collaboration, uh, private members' bills on equality matters do have the potential to, to make progress on important equality initiatives. But the equality agenda, as we know, is far from complete. And the bill before the House seeks to prohibit discrimination on the basis of a really critical ground, that tenth ground of social and economic disadvantage, a class background, in other words. It's a legislation which aims to, uh, to put in place provisions rejecting snobbery, rejecting class prejudice. And I think on that principle, we can all agree on the need to reject that particular ground of, of, uh, of discrimination. I'm conscious also, and I know Minister O'Gorman has joined us, that research published by um, the Department of Equality just last year, 2022, uh, clearly uh, highlighted the impact of this sort of discrimination in revealing that children from a disadvantaged class background were more likely to experience discrimination on the basis of their place of birth or parentage compared with children from more advantaged social classes. And the same research found that unemployed adults were the second most likely group to experience some form of discrimination after those of a non-white ethnicity. 30% uh, I think of, the, of unemployed adults compared to 33% of those from a non-white ethnicity. So I think these are, uh, this is some of the data which establishes what we all know to be true, which is that this form of class-based discrimination is prevalent in society and that legislation is needed to prohibit it. And in recent weeks, the impetus to stamp out discrimination of all kinds has been brought into sharp focus. Um, uh, as a society, as, uh, as legislators, we have an obligation, I think, a political and moral obligation to call out and eradicate bias and hate wherever it arises, on whatever ground and in whatever form. As per the trade union slogan, an injury to one is an injury to all. And I think strengthening of the equality legislation is something that we as legislators can do in a practical way to address uh, discrimination. And we in Labour are proud of our legacy, and the legacy in particular of former Minister Mervyn Taylor, the first Minister for Equality, and the Minister who pioneered the equality legislation which is being reviewed, which, the review of which is underway. He pioneered that and pioneered indeed the inclusion of nine grounds of discrimination. Um, and I'm thinking also of the contribution of another former Labour Minister, Niamh Brannock, who recently died very, very sadly, and we all, um, 
I know we're uh, um, hugely uh, um, so sorry to see her, her sad passage, uh, but I was reminded of her work on this by a tweet from Kieran Rose, the co-founder of the Gay and Lesbian Equality Network, who, recent, who recently, who following Neve's death, reminded us of the role she had played in the development of the original equality legislation. He reminded us that the bill as originally drafted was confined to discrimination on the basis of sex and marital status. This was a Labour private member's bill from 1990, which uh, created, I suppose, the, the, was the forerunner and created the, path, the passage to the equality laws we have in place today. Neave, alongside Dick Spring and Mervyn Taylor, met with Glenn, members of the traveller community and activists from ethnic minorities and other organisations. And following that consultation with civil society, uh, the bill uh, was, uh, um, uh, was became a much more inclusive bill, and as I say, despite um, being narrowly defeated in the Dáil later, it was formed the bedrock for the equality legislation that Mervyn Taylor, as equality minister, brought forward in the 1990s. So, you know, that was pioneering legislation then, uh, dealing with nine grounds of discrimination. But we do know that the, this tenth ground of socio-economic status or class should be added as a recognised ground. Uh, we all have heard stories and lived experiences of those who have suffered bias, prejudice, um, discrimination on the grounds of class. Uh, and, but currently there is no le form of legal redress. As chair of the Gender Equality Committee, uh, during our hearings last year, I and my colleagues heard, heard very clearly about experiences of intersectional discrimination. Uh, women who were discriminated against not just because of their gender, but also because of their class or indeed ethnicity or disability. So we're very conscious that part of the um, process that mechanisms we put in place for challenging intersectional discrimination must refer to socio-economic class. And indeed, in my own constituency in Dublin Bay South, we have a proudly diverse constituency. But I do hear from constituents who have had this insidious form of class discrimination directed against them. And I'm always frustrated to have to inform them that they have no legal basis for recourse currently. For example, I've been, I know that management of certain pubs and bars in my constituency have asked clients to leave citing their dress. In spite of the fact that the pubs are often full of people wearing very casual clothing uh, but you know the, those who've told me about this this very again insidious form of discrimination they have very clearly um, uh, reported that it was they, they experienced this because they have identified as being working class because they believe it was because of an accent it was because of a particular look um, another person tells me that uh, around applying for her first job, she gave her CV as a home ad her home address, a disadvantaged area in South Dublin, a very identifiable particular complex. Uh, she, gave, she could not find a job, no job available to her. One year later, she set out again, same employ sought work in the same employments, but this time giving the address of a relative living in a less uh, disadvantaged area, an area perceived to be more advantaged. And almost immediately, she started getting the interviews and uh, job offers. So th these are sort of very obvious examples that we all hear about and really you know as legislators we do have to address this if this is a pernicious and pervasive form of discrimination we must recognize it in our laws and address it in that way and I do you know just to conclude very much welcome uh, the fact uh, as we have, as we've said that the government has committed to examining the introduction of this new ground of discrimination based on socio-economic disadvantaged status we do very much welcome I think all of us in opposition the conduct of that review and uh, of equality legislation including an examination of the incorporation of this 10th ground. Um, but given the amount of work that's underway, given the cross-party consensus that does seem to exist uh, on both the government benches and opposition benches, I do think we could um, move more swiftly. And that there's no need, therefore, to uh, put in place an amendment delaying any further progress on this bill for 18 months. Uh, I think you know, that is likely to bring us beyond the term of this government, and therefore it's just too long a delay. I do want to just finish by saying, of course, in our report from the Gender Equality Committee, among the measures we recommend should be adopted by government was a constitutional referendum on equality that would uh, broaden the equality guarantee and make it more inclusive, as well as, of course, taking out the sexist language about women and replacing it with language that values and recognises the contribution of care in our society. And indeed, we also recommended a, a, a related amendment to uh, recognise more inclusive forms of family, more diverse forms of family. So I think we could very, you know, it would be very positive if we could see this year a commitment to adopt this bill or, or the provisions within it and indeed also to holding that equality referendum that the Gender Equality Committee and the Citizens Assembly have called for. Gerv Mackett. Deputy Patrick, uh, Deputy Gannon, again you've